morning. Uh, that is Jacob Stalin. That's for sure. <clears throat> so the reading of God's word today is in Romans 8, 28 through 32. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who died not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will be not also along with him? Graciously give us all things. So be it. Okay, just so you adults know, now I'm going to start preaching. (laughs) But I'm going to pray first. Dear Father in heaven, we do thank you that you love us so much, that you're in control of all things, that even though we are faithless and that we rebel against you, you still are faithful. And wow, what a plan that you have for us, that you would give us your only son as a sacrifice to save us. And he would say, to Father, forgive them for they know not what they do and it is finished so that we can know that it is complete. Help us through the power of your Spirit, not only realize that we are sons and daughters of the Most High, but that we have the Spirit of God living inside of us, that we are holy temples, that we are a group of holy priests called together to tell the world of the love of God through Jesus Christ. May your Spirit open up the words that that we read today, Lord, and speak. And Lord, I just thank you and praise you for all that you have done and all that you're going to continue to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I've said, today's message is entitled Relationships, and I started out with Romans to give us a thought process before we went in of of God, who this God is. If you missed last week, we went from the third part of God's sovereignty, and I never dreamed that I would be going there, and when I was listening to Moody off and on this week, I heard God's sovereignty, God's sovereignty. I was like, wow, you know, how, how did I ever get put in this mix where I'm preaching the same themes that Moody's preaching this week and stuff. I didn't plan that. God knew that that was going to be. And it sermons came out of that part of the scripture that I wanted to avoid about the arm of God being revealed and the power that, that He blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. Because that's a tough topic to talk about. But when you talk about the sovereignty of God, you see that in there, but you also see the love of God that offsets that so perfectly. And we talked about Jonah going to Nineveh. He gave an eight-word sermon, and 120,000 Ninevites fell down to their knees, put on sackcloth, repented, and worshipped God. Now that's a sovereign God. I don't know if you got that point or not. But Nineveh was the pagan city. God was able to put 120,000 souls into 120,000 vessels that he chose to bring glory and honor to him. He knew that they would repent. That still, they still had a choice in the matter. He didn't thumbnail them with it and say, you're going to do this or anything. He put those souls in there knowing that those souls would be obedient. If you don't know anything about Scripture later, Nineveh is destroyed because of wickedness and disobedience. Huh, it sounds like God's chosen people, the Israelites, that we read about over and over again where God chose a people, not because he wanted to have favorites, but because he wanted that people to give him glory and honor. And even when they disobeyed him, they still brought him glory and honor because he still used it in captivity or wherever it was, whatever things he used to bring him glory and honor. Because we read in John 12 when the audible voice came from heaven, it said, I will glorify my name. I have glorified my name. I always will glorify my name. That's Alan's version. That's not exactly how the scripture is, but that's what it speaks to me. That God is in complete control of all things. 
And knowing that, He still loves me. He still has a plan for me. And I have a choice of how I'm going to accept that and walk with it or not. But regardless, like in Jonah's life, He's still going to use me for His glory if I proclaim His word or not. Because Jonah went the opposite direction. He said, I'm going to flee from the Lord. It tells you that in there. He's fleeing from the Lord. Really? You can flee from God? And he's fleeing from God, but because he flees from God, God has that ship prepared. He has that fish prepared. He has the waves prepared. And I don't know if you, if you read anything about that, that's an area where there wasn't much wind. That's why they had the rowing capabilities on the boat. So when the storms did come up and the wind came in, they were like, where did this even come from? Which is more of a sign of God. But because of Jonah's disobedience, God still used him to bring the gospel message they didn't know it at that time who they were believing in because Jesus Christ hadn't been here yet, but they got faith in the God that would bring His only Son to earth. Those people repented of their sins and even made a pact with God, a pledge to God to serve Him is what Scripture says because of Jonah's disobedience. And then when he finally got himself to come to his senses and went to Nineveh, not by his own means, of course, but in the belly of a whale, or not a whale, a fish... Thank you. <laughs> I see the look of it. Not a whale. It's a fish. It might be a whale. Okay? And gets to Nineveh. He walks in. It says a day into a city that takes three days to go across. And then he just said, repent. Or he didn't say repent. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. So I'll see if I can get it right. There's eight words. Destruction will come in 40 days. I don't know if I had eight words or not. He didn't say God would bring destruction or anything else. I don't think he had a microphone or pedestal to stand up and have the word spread across that whole town. There wasn't cell phones. There wasn't Facebook. But the whole town repented because God was showing His glory and His might. Now let me tell you this. Maybe you hadn't thought about this. But who did that glory and might be shown to? We don't know. We only know that God showed that glory and might to one man. The rest of the world saw it, I'm sure, in everything. But we know that Jonah saw it. So God went out of His way to show all this to one man how sovereign He is. Wow. So that's where we're at now in relationships. You thought we were going on to John 13, didn't you? No, nope, not yet. <laughs> I don't know when that'll be. Relationships. Here's the definition from the dictionary. A state of being related or interrelated. The relationship connecting or binding participants in a relationship such as kinship. A state of affairs existing between those having relations or dealings. A romantic or passionate attachment. Definition of the dictionary has got here pretty good definitions. Relationship means it's your kin. means that you have a love, a compassion for them. You have the same common bonds. We are all born of the Spirit. We all have the Spirit residing in us if we believe. We have one God and Father, one Son and Savior, Jesus Christ, and one Spirit living in and through us if we'll let Him. But even if we don't let Him, God will still show His sovereignty. He'll work all things for His purpose, and especially according to those who love Him. So what do relationships mean to you? And I gave the... Sermon illustration of a life preserver. And I even had Jacob put on the life preserver because he's my only son. So maybe that would impact even more. And I had a false life preserver. It looked just like the real thing and everything. And it even said welcome aboard on it. But it's a wall hanging. Something that will not save you. But see, if you don't know that you're dying, then you don't even know you need saving. There's the Old Testament. So that when the salvation comes, the life preserver comes, that you'll know you need saving. And then that you don't view it, oh, okay, yeah, that, that's a pretty good thing. I'll hold on to that when I need it. But if you're really dying, if you're really going down for the last time, and someone throws you a life preserver, you're going to cling to it for all you have. That event is going to change your life. You're going to tell people about it. And then to know that God who when He does breathe, not only stars are formed, but billions and billions and billions of stars. I told you I can't comprehend that. I was telling Kim earlier, I was watching last night with Kara when I got home to give Sherry some reprieve. Uh, let it go, let it go. You know that song from Disney. 
It's got one and a half billion views. I can't comprehend that number. That is crazy. And we're going to watch a video in a second that might have 100,000 views. It's so sad that this video has this little in comparison to that. Not that there's anything wrong with a Disney song. Some, one of the guys was um, harassing Jacob a little bit because he went and saw oh, Mamma Mia or something with uh, Michaela because she wanted to see that. And I'm like, Jacob, you're the one that likes musicals. Don't even portray something that you're not. So the guy's like, ah, his daddy's here. Now we'll hear stories about him and everything. But then one of the guys, something was said about let it go, and he went, let it go. And I was like, ah, don't you be pointing your finger, even in something like that. It was funny. It's hilarious. But he was like, oh, you big mama's boy over here, when yet he with his grandkids. Yeah, I've sang that song a million times. Because <laughs> we'll do what we want to do because of those relationships that we have. But like I said earlier, you won't have the right relationship where you see that when your wife tells you, uh, my perception is this, you won't see it if you don't have this right relationship here. Because, yeah, then I don't hear an audible voice from heaven, but Scripture pops out left and right from the Holy Spirit about Alan this, Alan that. Al Wait a minute, where's the Scriptures about Sherry this? Uh, Alan this, Alan that. H here it is. What are you supposed to do? Humble myself before you and do what I can do to make that relationship right and do what I'm supposed to do regardless. So then I put down my phone and say, I don't need to show you the amount I was on the phone or anything else. I need to love you unconditionally. Do you know God in an intimate relationship? He designed and created you because He desired you, not because He needed you. And He passionately pursued you throughout history with a culmination of Jesus Christ, His only Son, dying on the cross to redeem you back to a right relationship. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. Do you get the passion there in that then? that He gave His only, one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. And we get to explain that to the kids in Awanas and stuff, because they're like, I don't understand. What's perish mean, first of all? Because we use King James Version and, and so forth in Awanas, for that verse anyway. And we tell them, well, that means you won't die. Well, well then they say, well, everybody dies. Well, what this means, it just gives so much opportunity for us. It means that you don't have to die eternally because God loved you so much. It's how we, how we tell people of the message that we have. Another thing that was spoken down there, the gentleman that Jacob's staying with tonight, that he had no, or last night, that he had no idea he was staying down there, said, so... Your talk was amazing that you had at this last walk. It convicted me, blah, 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 and I've heard that from several men, and that's good for me to hear. And I said, hey, tell him that. He needs that. Because up here, he'll sing the song, and then he's quiet until he gets his capo set up or whatever for the next song. And Darren, one of the guys, said, Really? With all you have to say, you're quiet? And then went on preaching to him, and it was so wonderful <laughs> to hear someone else, another godly man, instructing my son. Wow, you guys have so much to give to. And we're getting more and more children in here. We ended a Awana's program with around 40 kids. Wow. And yet the Bible tells us clearly to train up our children in the ways of the Lord, to choose life or death, blessings or cursings. It's pretty clear. And it says to write them on the door frames of your house, to talk about them when you get up, talk about them when you go to bed, sit down and talk about them when you eat. I heard something on Moody where... The woman was saying that her husband, every time he sits down for their meals, would read a chapter in the Bible. And I'm thinking, really? What about Leviticus and stuff? And what about Psalms 119, how long it is? And he reads a chapter. But she said what came out of that is when the kids came over to visit the other kids. What are we reading tonight? Wow. Let me humble myself before my God and see that His Word does not come back void, and see that He says to do these things, and I fail to do them because I don't see the significance of a God who can orchestrate Jonah and the fish. It's not just a fishy story. It's a true story. So we've been reading in John chapter 12 about those people that did believe in everything, but they didn't really have belief after all. Because they said they believed, they said they believed, they said they believed, but they didn't follow after Him. James says to not be deceived by saying one thing and then not doing that. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved 
through faith. There's no works involved in that salvation. And this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God. Not by works so that you can boast. But like James says, show me that your faith is true without those works. I just said it before. If you got saved literally, and you have been saved literally if you believe in God, but if you had literally out there on the river or wherever it's at, it would change your life. You would tell the story. You would be thankful. You would praise God. It would make a difference. So these people that said, I believe, but they failed to profess Jesus Christ because they were afraid of what the Pharisees would do. That's awful ironic. The Pharisees would kick them out of church. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, the irony in that. But to understand Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, you need to read the whole chapter. Okay? Just like when you're reading John 3, 16, you've got to read John 3, 3 that says, unless a man is born again. So you have to understand that. That, it, that is why God loved the world so much. So to understand those verses, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. It says, as for you, he's talking about the true believers, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. But if you remember, Jesus in John 12 says, he's, now his time has come, and the ruler of this world, Satan, his power will be taken away from him. He has no power over you. Used to, but not anymore. Verse 3 of Ephesians 2, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. But that's not me, Pastor. I don't do that. I gave this and this up. But did you start passionately pursuing God's service and calling for your life? Then you're still clinging on to something rather than that life preserver. Like the rest, you were by nature deserving of wrath. Not just wrath, but God who controls angel armies, who can split time and space. You were deserving of His wrath. But, <laughs> just like John 3.16... Because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive. So are you living? He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Clearly. Nothing else. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Well, well wait a minute. I'm not in heaven yet. That hasn't happened. Yes, it has. I am there with God in His presence through His Spirit that Jesus said it's better for me to go away so that the Spirit will come. You will do greater things in my name than what you could do walking beside of me. United in brotherly love and compassion. And He says, a good new commandment I give you, He'll say later, to love your neighbors, your enemies. Well, that's not new. Well, the part that he adds is, as I have loved you, because now you see the example. And we'll see that more when we get into John 13. But he has made us alive. That means we need to live while we're still in these mortal bodies. Giving worship back to God, which he designed and created us for, and even more, gave his only son to redeem us back as his child. Verse 7 why did he do this? Oh, in order that in the coming ages, now and in the future, the past from Jesus on when Paul wrote these words to now, we saw that. That was coming ages then, although it's the past now. But in these coming ages, he, God, might show the incomparable riches of his grace. The same reason he chose a nation, the same reason he let them become captive if they didn't follow after him, the same reason he used Jonah to proclaim to the people on the ship as well as the people in Nineveh. There's some speculation if you read on that Tarsus might have been Tarsus where Paul came from. Maybe that's when the gospel first made it back to where Paul came from later. I don't know. But I can see that in my God's plan. Oh, I can see that. <clears throat> to show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed how? in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Who would give up their son? God would for you. His one and only son He would give up 
to bring you back to Him. Now, for it is by grace you have been saved. Oh, I can understand that a little bit more. It's through faith. It's not by myself, nothing that I've done. It is a gift of God. Not by any works I've done, nothing that I can do. So I can't boast. I have to humble myself instead. And when I do that, I can see, read on verse 10, which you might be more familiar with, but not as familiar as you hear 2, 8, and 9. But verse 10 is, For we are God's handiwork. We're still here living. We're His handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus, restored anew, alive with the Spirit for our purpose of proclaiming the gospel message. His ecclesia, His church, called out a congregation, not a building, called out to proclaim the gospel message to the world. And the gates of hell will not prevail against this call. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Because He knew it from before we even knew about our own history. This was His plan to show how good He is. And let us be a part of it. Verse 11, therefore, that means we're tying together what we have already read. Remember that life preserver that was thrown out for you. That formerly you who are Gentiles, lost by your birth, and called uncircumcised or heathen in this world, by those who call themselves the circumcision or the righteous, okay, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreign as the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Not just to be a chosen people as Israel was, but to be a chosen child independently. To have a heavenly Father that through the Spirit we can cry out, Daddy, because I have that relationship with my heavenly Father. Verse 14, For He Himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in His flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in Himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And you see here it said, by setting aside in His flesh the law with its commands and regulations. That's why I said, if you want a sermon on tithing, I'll tell you tithing was a law. <laughs> the New Testament of what you should give is everything you have. Paul said to give your body as a living sacrifice. Everything. You don't put part of it up on the altar. You put it all on the altar. Daily you put it on the altar so that you can bring glory and honor to God and draw someone else to Him through Jesus Christ. So you give it all out of a clean heart, a pure heart. and God loves that. That is our proper way of worship. And true believers will worship Him in spirit and truth. And now the time has come for that to happen because God's Spirit is with us, lives inside of us. <clears throat> Verse 16, And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which He put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also, also members of His household. Built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus Himself being the chief cornerstone. In Him, the whole building, every single believer, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, in case you missed it, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by His Spirit. Wow, the whole chapter sounds really good when you read it that way. As long as you understand it and live it. And you don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You don't sit there and say, Oh, I know, God, what you've done through Jesus Christ. But, we talked about that too. That when his, Jesus' own disciples said, are, are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Is it now? Is it now? That's what we've been waiting for your whole ministry. Is it now? So we can end this Roman oppression? He'd already told them in John chapter 12 that, that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it won't produce a crop. 
Is it now? No, it's not for you to know the time and seasons. But I will give you what I promised, the Holy Spirit. And He will give you power to be united together, to love even your enemies, to proclaim the gospel message even though you don't know you have words to say, but they're all through here because it's being revealed to you in God's Word how much the Father loves you. This is the Father's love letter to you. Remember that, Father's love letter. Write that down, Father's love letter. It'll mean something to you a little bit more in just a minute, okay? So reading that, here's some questions for you. Is God sovereign? Is He in complete, of all, complete control of all things, including your path, your life? Does He love you? Has He redeemed you? And if so, what is the purpose that He redeemed you? How is this relationship with God Almighty, not just God Almighty, but your Father in heaven. There are many that cry, Lord, Lord. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. A significant theme of Jesus' preaching. The kingdom of heaven has come. Repent. Change your way of thinking so that it changes your behavior. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. Well, wait a minute. I thought we didn't have to have works of righteousness. You don't. All you need is grace. But you didn't really hold on to that grace and accept it if there's not proof of it in your life. You know, that's one of the fundamental differences between a lot of the churches is they don't think that we have a say-so ourselves so much. That if God has called you out and everything, if you're not called, then you can't be. Well, that is true, but it's not the point. If God did call you, what are you doing about it is the point. And we don't know. We're not God. We don't know what His plan is. So we have to cry out to each and every one, My Father saved me because of His love for me through Jesus Christ. Many, verse 22, many will say on that day, that day of judgment that will come again that is not here in John chapter 12 because Jesus says, I'm not come to judge today, but judgment time has come. The judgment time is what you're going to decide about whether you believe or not. And I'm going to give you examples. It's going to be your same reasons today. I do believe, but I'm not really going to profess it because I'm scared of this or that or whatever the reason is. And he puts them aside and says, they're not true believers. You read it any other way if you want to, but that's how I read it. The ones who believe in me will follow after me. And when we get to John chapter 13, you'll see that intimate instruction where then he even washes his disciples' feet. And he says, this is what I want you to do. The most despicable thing you can think of at that time was the lowly job of a servant who had to wash the feet of the people who came in off the dusty road where the animals walked and everything too. And he took on that job to show us the job we're supposed to take on. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, let me give you my excuses. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did I not proclaim your name? And in your name did we not drive out demons? I might have been a part of that one time in my life. <laughs> But that's a big thing. That would be the religious hoodoos of the day that cast out demons. And he's, this is what they're giving him for their recollection of why they should be in there. And watch what happens. And in your name perform many miracles. I don't know what these were, but, but they add this on to after the demons. Could they be bigger than demons? So it has to be a bunch more. I don't know what it is. But there's their justification. Did we not do these things? Did we not have these works? And these works should have proclaimed our faith, but God knows the heart. So even if you have the works of righteousness, <laughs> that's not going to save you. Only your faith in that life preserver is going to save you. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You know, I get up here and I say but a lot. And I say coincidentally a lot. Because God is sovereign. There's, sometimes you think that coincidence may not be. Sure, there are some coincidences. This is not one, though. I'm reading a book that I picked up because I saw it in Jacob's house. It was given to him, and it's signed 
uh, from the author to Jacob and Michaela. Hope this helps develop their relationship. Ooh, <laughs> okay. And they haven't read it. I've read it. It's a pastor I know from the walks. And the only reason I wanted to read it is because he wrote it. And as I start reading, I'm like, mm, this isn't going to be that good a read. And I don't know how it's going to be. And forgive me for saying that, Dave. <laughs> it's going to be the church that I happen to be doing the walk in as the spiritual leader that's the one that's coming up that we don't have any candidates for. But God will supply them if that's His will and purpose. And then I get my spiritual team together because I told God, you know, I would love to be the leader of the spiritual team. That's the three pastors that are there. But if you know something about my insecurities and stuff, <laughs> I got a little big church here and I don't have a big degree hanging on the wall. And so my pastors are, number one, I want to give you this pastor, the guy of the walk says. Okay, that's fine. I, I don't mind one being there. I don't have to pick them out or anything. Well, we met at his church yesterday for their meeting. Oh, I guess there's 10,000 people that go there. And I'm supposed to be spiritual leader of him? And then the other pastor that's coming on, I've tried to get some from local and it didn't work out. So I know God is sovereign. I know it's in his plan. The other one I have, oh, he do, does um, different things with theatrics and stuff. I don't want to tell you too much to not spoil your time if you went. But he owns a theater. <laughs> That's the other guy that I'm going to be over. <laughs> and I'm supposed to help give them spiritual guidance and direct them in this walk. So God's telling me, you know, I called you, Alan. Don't forget that. I called you. You said in your heart you want to do this position and I put it here. Would you have rather me give you two people so that you can show your might or two people that you, <laughs> I'm going to show my might through you, dude. Because <laughs> it ain't going to be about you. And, and then I'm down there thinking, we got one candidate. That's it for men's. What's going to happen? And I'm like, oh, God, you got this. And now, I do need to pray. And I do need to do stuff. I'm going to go out and try to get a candidate or two. If, if only a few of us got a candidate, we'd have enough. And, and I'm going to let you be God in whatever happens here. Because it's not by my might or anything i got to eat my own words that I sit up here and preach. How do you like that? Sometimes they taste pretty good. Sometimes they get, you kind of get choked on them. But in this book, this is a quote. Relationships, they are the starting point. The Gospel of John, <laughs> that's where we've been preaching for a while, uses these words to wed the concept, wed, of Jesus' incarnational purpose within our situation of developing understanding of who God is. Oh, we got to that point. Um, when he says, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who's trying, Jesus is trying to describe to us the Father, and therefore we read His Word and we understand His, and, and get in relationship with His Spirit. Who understands, um, he's never seen God, but the unique one, who is himself God and is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Goes on to say, I had never given a ton of thought to this need. We have to retain a posture of an emerging understanding of who God is. Until recently, when I was asked a question by my wife, if Jonah, <laughs> he, and this is all in the first chapter, guys, he and the sailors are in the ship in the middle of the storm, and he admits to them that he is the reason of their peril, Throw me overboard, he says, and they do it to appease the God they don't have any comprehension of. Ooh, that makes what I've said even more alive. Goes on to say, Like I said, I hadn't given the idea a ton of thought, but I knew an answer immediately, the perfect Sunday school answer. Jesus. And that reminds me of a story that I read one time about a Sunday school teacher and little Johnny that was in the Sunday school class. And she was talking and she said, you know, um, that this eats, eats nuts and, and then it puts up nuts to store them for the winter because it loves nuts. What am I talking about, Johnny? It sounds like a squirrel, but I know you're talking about Jesus because, see, that's the point of the lessons. Yeah, it is the point of the lessons, but, you know, oh, that childlike faith. I don't need to figure out the rest of the story. Not childish faith, childlike faith. It's about Jesus. So Johnny was right. <laughs> he, 
He just didn't understand the rest of it. That sounds like a squirrel, but I know the answer is Jesus. He goes on to write, he said, But I knew an answer immediately, the perfect Sunday school answer. Jesus Christ is what is different. We have a radically changed understanding of God because Jesus came in and explained God to us. First in His actions and then in His words. All done in the context, relationships formed by His being present with us. And yet when He left this earth, He said, It is better for me to leave so that the Spirit can come with you to increase your relationship with God the Father and with His children. Wow. All right, I've got to read you the rest part of Matthew 7 so you get the verses there on the many will cry, Lord, Lord. Here's what it says there. Starting in verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Not everyone who proclaims, right? And then if yours is an NIV, it says true and false prophets is a header. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Well, we, we should. We, we have all these. Wait a minute. He's going to tell us in a minute. Even though you see all these works, that doesn't mean that's good fruit. Okay? By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. So you might need to do a little picking, a little tasting to see if that fruit's good. And if you ever hear me preaching heresy or whatever, you better say it to your fellow brother and sister, and you better come to me if that ever happens. As long as I rely on the Holy Spirit, it won't ever happen. But I'm a man, and I will make my promise to you to be led as much as I can and preach God's Word and nothing else, no matter what's popular. Okay? <clears throat> A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Don't miss this point next. Every tree that does not bear good fruit, whether it thinks it's a good tree or not, it's cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, let me tell you again, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the ones who do the will of my Father in heavens. The work's part of the relationship because the relationship is real. Verse 22, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, since you've heard this message, so you can't stop there because you've got the therefore. Everyone who hears these words of mine, do you have ears? Are you listening? And puts them into practice. They are like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the storms rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine, and we've got a repeat of what we read earlier a couple times, and does not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Who are you building your relationship upon? I'm not talking about who you say you are. I'm talking about what your actions show. Verse 28, when he had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at their teaching. They were amazed at it, but that doesn't mean they followed after Jesus, that they grabbed a hold of the life preserver. Because he taught as one who had authority. Jesus today, many people will tell you that he was a good teacher, but not necessarily that he's God. That He might be a way, but He's not necessarily the way. Or maybe they'll even teach you that God is love. He is. He's love. Do you hear my sarcasm in that? Not that He's not love, but they'll throw in the butt there, or the and, or whatever, and He won't send anybody to hell. I believe the God of the Old Testament shows you that He has to. And you wouldn't want to serve a God who's not judge and jury, and who does it with justice and with mercy. 
And His mercy is through Jesus Christ. That is the way, the truth, and the life. A couple more things from that book of uh, Dave's. I really love my Bible. The Bible might create behavior changes in our lives, but that is not a good primary use of the Bible. The Bible here is, in my experience, the Bible is here in my experience for an entirely different purpose, to bring me into a one-on-one -on -one contact with God. May I not miss it. May it bring me face to face with my Lord and God so that I might know Him and His work in my life. First, we misunderstand our role in the presentation. We, were not, we are not a Christian ark distributing life preservers. I'm still in chapter 1 of this book, guys. There's a lot of coincidences here that we make available. Instead, we were much more like those we are much more like those we're sharing with. That bony finger of indignation whether we realize we're doing it or not. We are wearing the same life preservers that God made available to us. The difference is whether we're wearing or not. Neither are we on a Christian ark awaiting a beachhead. No, we're more likely to be treading water Next to the other guy, the only difference is we have a life preserver. Because see, he didn't tell us that this life was going to be easy. In fact, he said trials and tribulations you will have, and they'll prove your faith if you believe. book goes on to say, he is always wooing us. Come on, come to me, please, I love you as you wooed your significant other at one time, whether you are now. So then when I think my wife says, you didn't pay me much attention. Yes, I... Oh, maybe I should woo instead. Didn't happen that quickly, guys. <laughs> it took a little slapping first with the Holy Spirit talking to me through His Word. You know, that, you know, there were a lot of thoughts that shouldn't be there. And she's not here to hear it today. So, <laughs> He is always wooing. Those of us who know Him are wooed into a deeper understanding of knowing Him. And that deep understanding will change the way we interact with our world. Those who know Him a little are wooed into a deeper relationship of trust and love with Him that not only changes our view of the world, but also helps us to see Him at work in us and in it. Those of us who are getting introduced to Him are being wooed into a relationship where we begin to grasp that the way that we, that the way that we have been broken and in turn broken others does not stop us, will not stop us, will not stop God from seeking to restore us. He loves us and he can be, he can be, we can be mended only through God's love. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says, This is how God's love, God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sowing sacrifice to our, for our sins. I told you earlier to remember Father's love letter, right? Okay. Debbie, you'll be up afterwards. But first we're going to take some scriptures from God's love letter.